Good morning. Good morning. morning. Nice to be here on a beautiful day. Uh, Happy Sabbath. All right. So it is graduation week. So I see the the congregation is uh, uh, quite empty. I hate to say that word, but uh, because a lot of people are uh, probably at Central Church where a lot of the graduations are happening. So we have quite a few in our congregation that are on that list. So we have from eighth grade, uh, we have Kai and Hanuel that just graduated from eighth grade at Kalamaiki. We have Ethan who just finished eighth grade and also Maya who finished eighth grade. So congratulations to the eighth graders. As far as uh, high school, we have Lori, Laura and Lee and Cole who have all uh, graduating this weekend. We also had Lynette, who sometimes plays in the strings. She's graduating from UH. Uh, She only took two years to graduate UH. Uh, Quite impressive. So uh, if you meet those uh, individuals, please give them their congratulations. Um, Another announcement is next week, the 11th, Sophia is going to be getting baptized at Magic Island. That's correct, right? I think I'm reading that correct at 4.30. So we're going to be gathering at, a, at Magic Island at 4.30. The baptism will be at 5 o'clock. I remember the last time we had baptism, it was Tony, uh, where I think uh, Wayne almost got washed away with the waves. So I don't know if Sophia's going to do it at the same place, but looking forward to it. Every baptism is just so special. So if you can be there, uh, we'll see you there next week at 4.30. Uh, this is Pastor's plan, pastor, there's going to be a pastor's meeting on the mainland from June 16th through 22nd. So Pastor Enoch will be attending the pastor's meeting. This happens every five years. So Pastor Enoch will be attending that service. Uh, So he will be absent during those times. Um, This is the end of this month, June 24th through 26th. HMA, they're having the centennial celebration, 100 years uh, quite special. It was, I think it was a few years ago, but because of COVID, it's been postponed and they're going to be having a big ceremony uh, over that weekend. So please note that on the calendar. The guest speaker is Dr. Nihara, who is a professor. He's a physician professor at UCLA. He's a, a well known researcher in uh, sickle cell. He will actually be attending this church on the Japanese side. I've asked him to speak on the 25th for the Sabbath worship service in Japanese. So for those who understand the language, uh, please feel free to attend that side. Uh, That is it for announcements. We have uh, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. If we could all stand up and sing that together, or is that how we do it? Sorry, I haven't been on this one.
For those who can kneel, please kneel for prayer. For those who can't, uh, can be seated and then we'll pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us the privilege where we can come and gather together and worship, worship you. Thank you for loving us with your unconditional love. Thank you for forgiving our sins. Uh, we don't want to sin, but we continue to do things that, uh, that we don't necessarily want to do, saying bad things, thinking about bad things, but you're still there. They're like awesome parents where you just hold us tight and love us no matter what we do. Um, but help us today to remember that there was a price for that. You dying on the cross. We really thank you for taking our sins to the cross and uh, buying us salvation. Open our hearts as we get ready to sing a few more songs and to receive your word. Be with those who cannot be here today. Be with those who are uh, in bed suffering for an illness or for different reasons. Whatever reasons they may not be able to be here, be with them wherever they are, they are at. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Hem number eight, and we're going to sing all three. him for quite a while. It's a beautiful reminder, isn't it?
children, if you want to come, sit on the second row here. We have a story for you. years ago, actually when I was in high school, I learned how to fly an airplane. And they told me that I had to keep track of every flight that I took. And the more hours I accumulated, the more experience I had. And so I got a log book right here. And in this log book, there was a place for me to write down the date, where I started, where I was going to, the type of airplane, and how long it took me to get there. But there was an extra line in the logbook that said remarks. And in those remarks, I could write down anything I wanted to. And so I decided with my very first logbook, that I would write down the name of every single person that flew with me. And so the first name in the logbook here, it's dated July 31st at Angwin, that's in California, a local flight, one landing, and I took my best friend with me, his name was Terry Hansen. We had done a lot of things together. The next time I flew was about a week later. I took a girl with me. This was BC before Cynthia. <laughs> Her name was Margie Martz. We flew from Angwin down to a little airport that had a restaurant. It was called the Nut Tree. Some of you who had been to California might have heard of that place. And we had lunch there. And on the way back, it was a very bumpy flight. And she got sick. It wasn't for two months before my dad finally decided that he had to go flying with me. If other people were going to fly with me, my dad had to do it. That's a picture of me when I was still in high school and my dad standing next to me. You don't see in that picture how scared my dad really was. <laughs> if you were driving the car, would your dad be scared? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, so you won't do that for a few years. But if you were flying the airplane, would your dad be scared? Yes. I didn't know anybody could get air sickness or motion sickness before they ever got in the airplane. My dad was so scared that I made him ride in the back seat. Over the years, I have six other logbooks. And in these logbooks is a record of every person who ever flew with me. And as I look around the room here, I see some of those people. These books are going to fall off here just a minute. Um, one of the names in the last logbook is 
Joanne Boca. And the next page, Joanne Boca. More than 45 times she flew with us to Lanai. Joyce Garrigus. It's probably maybe 50 times Joyce Garrigus flew with us. I see Steve and Gail Asatani flew with us to Lanai. And Mark Ferguson flew with us to Lanai. And Mark Ferguson actually kissed the ground when we got back to Honolulu. <laughs> I've never seen anybody do that before. Okay, there's Daniel Stratus. I couldn't count how many times he's flown with us, but probably 20 times, maybe. Okay, uh, Ken Kenjo, years and years ago, a couple of times he flew with us to Lanai. Okay, and Ken preached each time. I don't know whether they were more afraid of flying with me in the plane or they were more afraid of preaching. Okay, when they went with us to Lanai. But these books are very important. The first entry in the very first book was July 31, 1970. When we sold our airplane two years ago, the last entry I put in the logbook was July 31st, the same date, 2020, exactly 50 years to the very day since I got my pilot's license. Now, these books are important to me because this is a record of my life. If you were to name a date, okay, I could look at this book and I could tell you what I was doing on that day almost. So these books are very important to me. Um, it tells me where I was, it tells me who I was with, and it tells me where I was going. But do you know that you... Your name is in a book also, even though it's not in one of these, maybe. Do you know that God has a book in heaven with your name in it? Did you know that? Good for you. Luke 10, 18 says, Rejoice because your name is written in heaven. The book is called the book of life. And it's a record of all the things that you've been doing. The good things and sometimes some of the mistakes that you made. I'm proud to say that the 50 years that I flew an airplane, I never had an accident. Have you ever been in a car accident? I've been in several car accidents. But I never had an accident in an airplane. I never even got a parking ticket. But not every flight ended the way I wanted it to. This picture is a picture of a flight that ended very badly. This is South Lake Tahoe. And you can see in the picture, it's almost dark. You know where South Lake Tahoe is? It's a pretty place, isn't it? And there's a lot of mountains around there. Well, we flew back from South Lake Tahoe at night. And we flew over Sacramento. You know where Sacramento is? Okay, in California. We flew over the city of Sacramento at night and the visibility was zero. It was all foggy. And we landed back at the Angwin Airport where the runway, there were no runway lights. All there was was a light on the gas pump. And we landed safely. But I wasn't home yet. On the way home from the airport, I got in a car accident. A car coming up the hill as I was going down the hill actually came over into my lane and we hit head on. And all my front teeth got knocked out. And so not every flight ends the way you wanted to. Another flight, July 16, 1976, a trip to Nome, Alaska. Watson Lake, British Columbia to Fort Nelson. The weather was beautiful, but then it started to rain. And so we decided that we would turn around and go back. We were going to be safe. But we didn't know that the weather had moved in behind us, and there was thunderstorms, and there was hail, and there was wind. But we did land safely. This picture is my favorite picture of all. Do you know who that is? That's 
my wife. She has flown with me more than I can count, really. But I would guess it's probably about 800 times. This is one of our trips to Lanai at Thanksgiving time. We used to take pumpkin pies, as many as we could fit in the plane, to the church members over on Lanai. You like pumpkin pies? One of my favorites, too. But what have I learned from all of these experiences? What have I learned from these books? From that experience, flying in the bad weather, I learned that no matter how bad it gets, don't ever give up. Do you know what that means? Do you ever feel, Amari, do you ever feel like giving up? But you've got to learn that no matter how bad it gets, you never give up. In an airplane, failure is not an option. But the most important thing is that God is powerful enough to protect you in an airplane, in a car, or just walking across the street. God loves you, and God has a plan for your life. And your name is in the book in heaven. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the young people in this church. We pray for them as they grow and they learn to love you, that they will always remember that their names are recorded in heaven. We pray, Lord, for each one of us that we will be together in heaven. In your name we pray, amen. Let's stand as we sing our opening song this morning, number 341. We're going to sing all three verses, To God Be the Glory, number 341.
Good morning, church family. Before I jump into the message this morning, I want to invite four lovely people up here. Um, Maya, come on up. Ethan, where's Ethan? Oh, on the side, yes, Hanul and Habul. Uh-oh, oh good, she didn't, sorry? Sorry, oh, not Habul, sorry. Sorry, you're not twins, what am I thinking? <laughs> Um, and Kai. Is Kai here today? I didn't see her today. Okay. All right. So the three of you, so go ahead and face the audience here. Let's see. Let's get you over here on the camera. Come on over this way. We don't have Kai today, but we're going to celebrate you guys anyway. So uh, what you may not know, actually, I think it was uh, announced at announcement time. In fact, I don't think they celebrate graduation at your school, do they? Is that what I heard? No. You just kind of shoo into freshman year. No big celebration? Well, we as your church family want to celebrate you today. Is that all right? Is that okay? All right. So we're excited that you guys have finished uh, elementary school and that you have taken the next step into, uh, into the wild blue yonder. No, actually, you're not going to be at the same school next year, are you? Okay. You're going to be at HMA next year? Well, congratulations. That's exciting. I'm sure Talia will be excited to have you there. I'm sure she's already told you that. Ethan, you get to stay at the same school next year? Aha. Uh -huh. And Hanul, you're transferring campuses, right, from elementary to high school. So there will be a bit, a bit of a change for you as well. But it uh, sounds like maybe some of your friends will also go to HMA next year. Is that right? Nice. So you'll be able to take some of your classmates into the next step. So some people don't celebrate uh, eighth grade graduation, as we know, but uh, we certainly want to do that, and we're excited to just celebrate with you your commitment to excellence and to listening to the voice of God. And we pray that as you make this transition, as with many other transitions in life, that, um, that there's one important thing that you take with you in every transition, and that is your commitment to God and commitment to excellence. So we celebrate you today, and I, I put a Bible verse also on your card, and I picked out, they didn't have it at the local bookstore, so I've got to order one for the guys, but I have a, a nice devotional book that I, I'm sure you will enjoy, and Kai will enjoy, and then uh, I've got one picked out for the boys, but it's not here, so I might have to order it online. So that will be coming later. The nice thing about devotionals, just put a little plug in there, okay? As you're moving into high school, life gets slower or busier. Yes, as with most things in life, <laughs> a promotion, life gets busier, kids, uh, life gets busier, moving from elementary school to high school gets busier, into college gets busier. So every step of the way, we want to make sure that we, um, that we as a church help to facilitate that process of, of growth and encourage your walk with the Lord. And so a devotional is nice because sometimes we complain. What are, what's the biggest complaint that we have uh, as adults? We're too what? Busy. We kind of pat each other. Oh, you're too busy? Oh, yes. And we pat each other on the back for being so busy. Well, we never want to be so busy that we don't have time to take a moment with God in prayer and study. And so that's why I appreciate devotionals, because you can't use the excuse, oh, I'm too busy. Devotionals are usually very short, just a few minutes long, gives you the reminder to, to have prayer and connect with God at the beginning or, or at the end of each day. And so we want that for you guys. All right? So, yay! <laughs> you can go back to your seats now. We continue our journey in Matthew chapter 5, the longest sermon that Jesus preached, the Sermon on the Mount. And of course, it doesn't just have the Beatitudes. Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount continues beyond the Beatitudes, but this will conclude our Beatitude study, and then we might highlight some of the other things in Jesus' sermon as we continue our studies in the Bible. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. 
Now, I think all of us can raise our hands to say that we have been persecuted <laughs> at one time or another, but how many of us can raise our hands to say we were persecuted because of righteousness? Because our lives, we chose to live our lives with righteousness, therefore we were persecuted. Not all of us can say that, can we? During China's Boxer Rebellion in the 1900s, insurgents captured a mission station and blocked all of the exit gates except for one. And in front of that gate, in order to leave, they placed a cross flat on the ground. Then the word was passed from person to person inside, and they said, whoever would willingly trample across the cross would be set free showing that they denounced Christ as their Lord and Savior. As the story goes, terribly frightened, the first seven students walked across, trampling the cross, and they passed safely to the other side and were allowed to go free. But the eighth student, a young girl, refused to commit this sacrilegious act. In fact, she walked over to the cross and knelt beside the cross and had a prayer for strength. She arose and moved carefully around the cross and went out to face the firing squad. Seven had taken the easy route. Maybe they justified it. Maybe they said, well, this is ridiculous. We don't have to follow these people's plans. In fact, this wasn't the real cross that Jesus hung on, so is it really a big deal? Seven took off to safety but after this one act of this strong woman, there were many others that were strengthened by her example, and every one of the remaining 92 students followed her to the firing squad. Persecuted for the sake of righteousness, in fact, giving up the one thing that often we hold on to very tightly, life itself. Shall we pray? Father God, we are reminded today by your word that you have called us to a life of righteousness, right living, right doing, living according to the principles of your kingdom. And Lord, so often we fail, yet we realize that you've called us to a life of righteousness, a life of holiness and purity. And so today, Lord, we pray that you will speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, touch us in a way that maybe we haven't been touched before. In the quietness of our seats, whether watching online or here at church, Lord, we just want to pause for a moment to invite you to personally speak to us and give you that permission right now. Yes, Jesus, please speak to us individually and corporately as we study your word. In your name we pray, amen. You see, sometimes we forget that it can be costly to live righteously and speak boldly for our faith. The first seven beatitudes that we've already studied, they lead naturally into this eighth beatitude. Let's turn there to Matthew chapter 5, if you're not there already. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 10. You see, the first seven lead us naturally to this eight. The, the more we demonstrate the characteristics of the kingdom of, uh, in our, our lives, as we back up and look here, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. The meek shall inherit the kingdom of, of the, uh, inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled Blessed are the merciful, because they will have mercy, and the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we see this culmination, those who choose to live according to the principles of heaven will not, I repeat, will not be popular here on this earth. Now, we can say that, yes, people will know that we are Christians by our love, 
and that's wonderful, and that's amazing, yet that has led to an early death for some people. Why? Because the darkness resists the light. The light shines in the darkness, and it, and it shows what's behind and what's in the shadows. So just because we say, yes, they're going to know that we're Christians by our love, doesn't necessarily mean that in the world's eyes that that's a good thing. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It continues in verse 11, kind of saying the same thing but in different words. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Think about Jesus. Was he persecuted falsely? Yes. Were some of the things that they said about Jesus true? Yes. Some were false and made up, but other ones were true. He did claim to be the Christ. Blasphemy. But notice, it says, say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Just because it may be false in the world's eyes doesn't mean that it's false in heaven's eyes, right? So that's why when we live for the kingdom, we might get accused, we might get persecuted, we might be put down, we might be put to death, but it's based on falsehood according to the kingdom. Notice what it says in 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Rejoice. Seriously. Rejoice when you're persecuted. Not just persecuted, but persecuted for what? For righteousness' sake. I've been on the receiving end of some persecutions. (laughs) But it has more to do with my, uh, my bad behavior right? I was on the receiving end of many uh, persecutions as a child. (laughs) If I told you some of the things that I was persecuted by, like a, well, I won't say it. Anyways, it hurt, okay? But it hurt for a purpose, didn't it? Sometimes, even in our spiritual walk, in our spiritual life, there are things that remind us of maybe those disciplines we received as a child from our parents, And we say, ouch, ouch, it hurts. But yet there's a purpose for it. We'll get to that in a few minutes. But it says rejoice and be exceedingly glad. See, persecution is almost like like God's stamp of, of approval, golden stamp in a believer's life. The last beatitude is kind of like... um. Well, it's one that has a double blessing, as you notice here. And it says, for, though, uh, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, when you're suffering for righteousness' sake, you're in good company, aren't you? And uh, we'll get to some of those stories here in a minute. But this one caught my eye. It was Charles Spurgeon, okay, uh, famous in the Christian world. He was severely depressed over the criticism that he had received in his ministry, And his wife, as any good wife would do, would comfort him. And she got this idea, and she printed up all eight of the Beatitudes on a large sheet of paper, and she tacked it to the ceiling above his bed. (laughs) That's kind of ingenious, isn't it? So that when he went to bed at night and woke up in the morning, he could be reminded of the kingdom of God that he was pursuing. Not to look at those that would find fault with him, but to be reminded that he was called to live a righteous life no matter what was happening around him. She wanted him to remember first thing in the morning, last thing at night, that righteousness will be persecuted. Now, we have to be careful with that, right? Because sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we'll convince ourselves that we're being persecuted for righteousness' sake when in fact... Um, Uh, maybe we're deserving of some uh, tongue lashings from time to time, if done in the correct spirit. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 9, Christ taught that in the end of times, believers would be hated by all nations. 
It would be hated. Persecution will only continue to grow as we're seeing in the world today, as we get further and further away from God. And as this world becomes darker, the light and believers will become more offensive. So how can we refrain, uh, remain faithful in our suffering? It's interesting that the, the Greek word here, persecuted, okay, translated as persecuted, it's literally a, a passive perfect part, participle, a passive perfect participle, and it can be translated, wait for it, allow themselves to be persecuted. Hmm. Blessed are those who allow themselves to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. There is a time to resist persecution. There's also a time to allow. I remember, um, wasn't it Wycliffe that kept escaping when he was trying to put the Bible into print, right? And he kept escaping, okay? But then there were other men who were what, what some um, historians call the seeds of spreading the gospel, like Huss and Jerome. They were burned at the stake. They died singing. They died with joy in their hearts. But it was the very blood of the martyrs that fueled the Reformation, wasn't it? There may be a time when we are called on to do the same. That's a sobering thought. But what's shocking about these in-time believers is they're willing to undergo persecution in order to pursue righteousness and to preach truth and to honor God. They're willing to bear the cross for Christ's sake. It reminds me of the 12 disciples. We don't always focus on how they ended their life here on this earth, but it's sobering when you look at the list in totality. Think about it. John died of extreme old age, but he was also stuck on an island all by himself, wasn't he? Judas Iscariot hanged himself, as we know. Peter was crucified, and he refused to be crucified like Christ, and so he said, I want to be crucified upside down. Andrew died on a cross. James was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple and then beaten to death. Not things that we like to think about or highlight. Bartholomew died while being tortured very gruesomely. James, the elder son of Zebedee, was beheaded there at Jerusalem. Thomas, the, the doubter, was killed with a lance. Philip was hanged against the pillar uh, in Herodopolis. Thaddeus was shot with arrows. And Simon died on a cross. These were the people that we read about in Scripture. These are the men who wrote the Bible. Men that were righteous in the kingdom's eyes, yet they died a certain death at the hands of those that were threatened by that very righteousness. They were an offense to the world around them. Christ gave two reasons that we will suffer persecution. First, it says, for righteousness, and then he says, those who suffer for my sight, my sake, right? Also, those who suffer on account of Jesus. Notice what it says in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 5. It says, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. What was the point that Jesus was making here? It's not hard to figure out if you know the story of the scribes and Pharisees. They were constantly talking good about themselves, showing their righteousness to those around them. But yet Jesus says, your hearts are far from me. Uh, see, that's a sobering reminder for us too, right? 
We might be dutiful about coming to church. We might be dutiful about, you know, teaching or preaching once in a while, right? We might be uh, uh, dutiful in, in the things that we know other people will see and glorify, yet where is that righteousness? Is it coming from the heart? And so we see that these, that these two statements clearly parallel each other. We're suffering for righteousness and we're suffering because we align ourselves with Christ. Think about in the Old Testament, someone who was taken captive along with three of his friends and many, many countless others from Jerusalem. You know who I'm talking about, right? Daniel. Daniel and his three friends, they're taken, and right from the get-go, their righteousness, their spirituality is brought into account. Will they partake? Will they eat of the food that's served before them? Again, we could come up with all kinds of reasons. Man, you're just taken captive. Don't buck the system. Do whatever you need to do. Just get along. You know, uh, we can make some good um, excuses for why we do some of the things that we do and just try to get along. They were from Jerusalem, just like all the other young men that were captured. But notice that they were different. There was something that was different about them. They didn't just uh, give in because they were taken captive. They didn't give up on God or the biblical truths that they had learned from a young age. They didn't compromise their diet. They didn't compromise their worship. Remember out on the plains of Dura, the golden statue was erected. Daniel wasn't there, but the three men that were with him in captivity were. And they could have easily, I like how some people say, well, they could have just pretended to tie their shoe. I'm not sure they had shoe laces, but, you know, they, they could have just kind of done this number, right? And taken a little extra time. Is, oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> it's over. All right. Whew, that was a close, close call. They didn't make excuses. They didn't try to appear to go along. They said, no, this is, this is actually contrary to biblical teaching. I will not bow. We will not bow. Although everyone else, hundreds of thousands of people were probably gathered there for this, uh, we don't know the exact number, but for this celebration that the king was putting on. But they refused to compromise their worship for righteousness' sake. We love these stories, don't we? I loved them as a, as a kid. I love them now. You know, it's such a cool story. They, they take those three men, they heat that furnace up seven times hotter, and man, they're like killing their own guys. The guards are falling over dead just trying to heat the fire and those that were trying to cast them into the furnace. And wouldn't you know it, how can you stand up in that heat? What in the world's going on in there? They, they, you know, they can't get too close because it's so hot. But those guys aren't even laying down yet. They're, they're, they're closed. They're, they haven't even caught on fire. What in the world? This is nuts. And hold on a minute. The, the plot thickens. How many of those guys do? I thought there was only three. There's Another one. And notice what the account says. It has the face of the Son of God. Face like God's face. What? How did they figure that out? It was a spiritual divine revelation, don't you? What a powerful story. And then, of course, because of that, those men come out. And they could have pretended to tie their shoe, but instead they won the heart or at least began the process. We know the, the king still had his struggles. But they began the, the process of this king saying, whoa. I, I, there's a lot of powerful gods that I know of, but what in the world? This, this one's beyond, beyond anything else I've ever seen. And then he says, now you all have to worship this one. <laughs> this is the best god. You worship their god. <laughs> kind of misappropriated, but you know. Uh, you could see that the, his heart was being challenged, wasn't it? The other touching story, sometimes it's hard to even think about or read about. 
about the story of Cain and Abel. Here they are, the first two kids, it sounds like, that are born to Adam and Eve. Abel brings his offering as God requested and asked. The lamb, without blemish, offers it to God. Cain observes God consuming the sacrifice. Cain proudly puts his offering there on the altar, which was not what God had asked for, and then said his prayer or whatever it was that uh, their tradition was, and nothing happens. What had Abel done wrong? Shame on Abel, right? How could he do that? Take all of God's attention for himself and Cain didn't get any? See, the world wants us to twist stories like this in the Bible around. Abel did nothing wrong. Abel simply followed the plan, the guidance of Creator God and brought his offering on purpose the way that God had asked for. He was what? Righteous. Cain was offended by the righteousness of Abel. And he rose up against Abel and killed him. The first martyr that we see in the Bible. Killed because of their righteousness, because of righteousness sake. He was executed. Notice what it says in John chapter 3. Turn with me to John chapter 3. Let's start in verse 18. This is speaking of Jesus, of course, the Son of God. It says, He who believes in Him, Jesus, is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the, what? World, and men loved darkness rather than light. So Jesus comes in as the light, but men say, no, we'd rather have the what? The darkness, because light illuminates the darkness. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So rather than saying, yes, Jesus, we need your, your cleansing, we need your salvation, we need to confess our sin and turn from our ways and look to Jesus, they said, nope, we'd rather just get rid of you. Notice, that's what we see exemplified in the scribes and the Pharisees. It was because of Jesus' righteousness that they were offended, even before Jesus started calling them out towards the end of His ministry. Look back in Scripture. He doesn't take them head on until later in His ministry. They're offended because He's doing good things on the Sabbath, because He's healing, because He's taking the attention away from them. Has He ever taken credit or, or accepted glory from people? No. He always points where? To the Father in heaven. He's not doing this for his own fame or to make himself look good. He's our perfect example, right? And so, but they were still offended by that. But later, Jesus starts pointing out their evil deeds. But again, the darkness does not like the light because their deeds are evil. Verse 20, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed, but he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. So, if we, were of, if we are of the kingdom of God, we do not fear the light, right? We come to the light because we know it's the light that exposes us. It's the light that can change us. 
into his image. So we don't run from it. To be honest, the person in a classroom where everybody is cheating and to possibly report or speak out against those things on those who are cheating, what kind of a response will that provoke from your classmates, do you think? Are they going to be like, oh, you know what, thank you so much for pointing this out because um, I've really been struggling with cheating and now that it's come to light, I can, you know, confess and make everything right and live peaceably again. That'd be great. Most of the time, are you kidding me? You're going to be shunned. You're going to be hated. They're not going to want to sit with you at lunch. They're going to give you dirty looks, pass you dirty notes. Not well received. How about the workplace where others regularly gossip and talk negatively about the leadership and maybe they get drunk after work and they invite you along to participate in these things? But if you're the one that declines to participate, how are they going to feel towards you? Resentment, frustration. Remember, the evil doesn't like the light. You might actually get passed over for promotions, or you might be harassed at work, maybe even fired because of your righteousness, because you're living for the kingdom. Notice what happened to Daniel in the Bible. He got fired. They tossed him. Not only did he get fired, but they, they, they tossed him to his certain death, right? To the lion's den, his co-workers worked it all out, dreamed it all up, and said, oh, king, look at this guy over here. He doesn't like you and respect you as much as we do. Look what he's doing. He's praying to some other who knows what, you know. He's not honoring you as the king. Daniel was not living unrighteously. But his co-workers got him sent to the lion's den. You may not face lions, but your persecution will increase as you expose sin and call for righteousness, as Jesus did. So there might be harassment, ostracism, persecution. They're all on special order for us as Christians, aren't they? Persecution for righteousness' sake also happens as a result of spiritual warfare. Notice in Job chapter 1, when God drew attention to Job's righteousness, <laughs> whose attention did it attract? Satan. Huh, what? Job? Who's Job? Oh yeah, I know that guy. <laughs> it, it led Satan to accuse Job and seek permission. Oh, he only serves you because look at how blessed he is. You've done this and this and that. Look at all the all the, the children he has and the wealth that he has. Job, nothing. He's so blessed. If you just took some of those things away, he'd curse you and die. Wow. Job lost his job, his family, and eventually his health. And it was all rooted in the spiritual realm. He was attacked because of his righteousness, living an upright life commonly happens to believers, especially when they're on fire for God. Satan will afflict us because of our, our righteousness in order to defer us, deter us from living for God. Satan will afflict us because um, he wants to uh, destroy the kingdom of heaven. He wants to derail us from the relationship that we have. Let's be clear, Satan not only uses demons, but he also uses the lures of this world to deter us. Tertullian, a second century author, as you might know, Christian leader, was approached by a man who said, I've come to Christ, but I don't know what to do. I have a job that I don't think is consistent with what Scripture teaches. What can I do? I must live. Tertullian replied, must you? For Tertullian, there was only one option. Obey and honor Christ. Survival was secondary. 
Sometimes we, we love and hold on to our life or the things of this world so tightly that we forget that first and foremost is our commitment to living a righteous life, our commitment to living for the kingdom of heaven. And by the grace of God, he will perform that in us. See, I've got way too much here uh, to cover today, so let me uh, fast forward. So bearing the, the, the character of the Beatitudes always leads to bearing the persecution of the final Beatitude. It won't always be extreme in nature, such as imprisonment or burning at the stake. Often it will be subtle, like being considered strange or weird or archaic. But, it will be pers- uh, but, we, but we will be persecuted if we are truly part of the kingdom of God. 1 Peter 3, if you have your Bibles, 1 Peter 3 and I'm going to wrap it up here shortly. So 1 Peter 3, starting in verse 13, and you, uh, I'm sorry, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, notice Peter here is referring back to this beatitude, right? If you, are, if you do suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Verse 17, for it is better. If it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So how should we respond to persecution? We're going to end with this thought. How should we, would, how should we respond to persecution? If you turn the page to chapter 4, maybe it's on the same page in your Bible. Chapter 4 calls us in verse 12, it says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as some strange thing happened to you. Just don't, don't think it's strange that you are disliked because of righteousness. But rejoice, what does it say? But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. So God calls us to do what? To rejoice and be glad in our suffering. It can literally be translated, leap for joy. (laughs) <laughs> when, when we have these various trials because of our righteousness. And this is what has happened throughout biblical history. In Acts 5.41, the apostles, after being flogged by the Sanhedrin, you may remember the story, left rejoicing because they had been counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. Wow. How about Acts 16.25, just to name two? While in prison, Paul and Silas were praying and what? Singing hymns, they rejoiced in the midst of their suffering. Surprisingly, joy and suffering is not an uncommon experience for those that are being persecuted for their faith. Kent Hughes shares two powerful stories. I want to share them with you. They're testimonies. One was a testimony by Samuel Rutherford, the saintly Scottish pastor who wrote from his prison cell, I never knew, notice what he says, this is his experience, right? I never knew by my nine years of preaching so much of Christ's love as he taught me in Aberdeen by six months of imprisonment. So, to put it in simple terms, in six months of imprisonment, he learned more than in his nine years of preaching. 
There's something that happens when we are suffering for righteousness' sake. He actually goes on to say this, Christ's cross is such a burden as sails are to a ship or wings to a bird. I'm going to say it one more time. Christ's cross is as much a burden as sails are to a ship. Sails on a ship are very heavy, aren't they? Especially if you count the big booms that that have to support the sails. But if I were to say, hey, let's sail from here to, you know, uh, the Philippines. But let's not put the sail on because it's pretty heavy. Would you get on the ship with me? You probably wouldn't get on the ship with me anyway, so bad illustration. <laughs> well, anyways, if I was the captain of a ship, anyway. But yeah, you definitely question my, uh, my um, sense of uh, good judgment. <laughs> so remarkable. Oh, oh sorry. The next, oh, the next one was a Romanian pastor. He describes how he was imprisoned and tortured mercilessly, and yet he experienced joy. He was locked in solitary confinement. He had been summoned by his captors who would would cut parts of his body and torture him. Then he'd return to his cell where they would starve him, not offer him any food. Yet in the midst of the sadism, there were times when the joy of Christ so overcame him that he would pull himself up and shuffle about the cell in a holy dance. That's probably what kept him alive. And notice what he did. It was so remarkable, uh, his his joy, that, that on his release from prison, he returned to his home and he chose to fast for a day. A man who was starved and tortured chose to fast for a day in memorial to the joy that he had known while he was in prison. Wow. Suffering that comes along with being a follower of Christ is great. But the joy that God provides, when we look at story after story after story, there is joy in suffering for Christ. When the Bible says rejoice and be glad, those are imperatives in the Greek. They're not just mere suggestions, but holy commands. Rejoice and be glad in your suffering. The interesting thing is that it's God that gives us the joy in our suffering. It's not humanly possible for someone to be tortured in their body and starve to death in a cell, but yet muster all the strength that they have to dance to the glory of God when no one's looking. That does not come from man. That comes from God. Christ says about those who are persecuted for righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. That's an emphatic statement as well. It's emphatic, meaning them alone. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for they are the only ones who will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's why it's no wonder, we're not scratching our heads, wondering why We know that these great men of the Bible will be in heaven because we see their suffering. You see, when we remember that the suffering for righteousness puts us in company with with prophets like Elijah who was hunted by Ahab and Jezebel because he was righteous. The righteousness of Jeremiah left him imprisoned and tradition says that he was stoned to death. Similarly, Similarly, Isaiah was sawn in two. John the Baptist was beheaded, Christ was crucified, Stephen was stoned, the ten of the eleven disciples, excluding Judas, were martyred. As we rightly consider the suffering for righteousness, it should cause us to be glad, yet they seem contrary. Literally, we are to leap for joy when we suffer persecution. And it's just that, that when we suffer persecution, we know that God is doing something right in us, if it is for righteousness' sake. Father God, we are reminded 
by this message, that you are a holy God, that you are a loving God, that you are the God of gods, and that as we choose to live for your kingdom, that we are going to look weird. We are going to be peculiar. In fact, some of those who are addicted to living in darkness will be angry when we shed light. But Lord, we will not refuse to shine for you. Because we know that our kingdom is not of this world, and, and we will not fear the one who can kill the body, Satan and his minions. We will have a holy reverence. We will have a fear for the one who can destroy both soul and body, Lord, which is only you. And so we will live for you knowing that your kingdom is holy and just and true. And we pray, Lord, for your righteousness your, your garment of righteousness to cover us so that when we are seen by men, that it's not us that they see, that it's your righteousness, that it's your love, that it's the fruits of your spirit that are manifested because of our decision to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, Lord, we just ask that you will bless us and keep us close to you, that we can go anywhere and not be alone, that you will be our righteousness. God is our prayer in your name. Amen.